your Bibles tonight, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, I'll tell you a funny story. When Ruth and I first started dating in Bible college, we just kind of started showing up around each other a lot. And uh, Pastor Sexton met me at the door. I was a a uh, fresh sophomore in Bible college, so it's kind of shameful. I'd already been in Bible college for one year. And Pastor Sexton meets me at the door of the auditorium, and he says, How you doing, Boaz? <laughs> and I looked at him like this. I said, Excuse me? He smacked me. He said, How you doing, Boaz? I said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. I'm so stupid. I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, you know, Cody, the Moabitess. I said, do what? He said, Ruth, Cody, Ruth. I went straight to my dorm and read the book of Ruth. It's been my favorite ever since. <laughs> I learned the characters of the book of Ruth. And uh, I remember when. I was a sophomore in Bible college. And what a beautiful story. It starts with tragedy, though. And tonight we're going to look at the most tragic character, one of the most tragic characters in the book of Ruth. His name is Elimelech. His name is Elimelech. And uh, just a brief synopsis of the book of Ruth. Elimelech takes his wife Naomi and their two boys, Malon and Chilion, and they leave Bethlehem, Judah, the place of God's blessing, in a time of famine. They go to Moab. Moab was a pagan land and God's people were forbidden to go there. Uh, but things get tough and they go to the world. Elimelech's a backslider. When they go to the world, here's what happens. In brief, Elimelech dies. His boys marry two pagan Moabitess women and both of his boys die and Naomi, his wife, is left uh, by herself. She's left alone with these two pagan daughter-in-laws and so the two daughter-in-laws Leah and Ruth and is it Leah I can't remember I just forgot is that right Ruth and Orpah there it is Ruth and Orpah the two pagan daughter-in-laws uh, they make a decision and Ruth makes the right decision she decides that I'll just go with Naomi and I'll make your God my God and they end up Back in Bethlehem, Judah, they meet Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and God does an amazing thing. We'll see those, those stories here in the next few weeks. But the first and the most tragic story is Elimelech. In the first five verses of this book of the Bible, the book of Ruth, we go and we see the funeral of three people, three men, three very important men to Naomi, her husband, and her two sons. And we look at this and we come and we see a tragic situation. Do you know that all of us, unless the Lord returns, will find our bodies laid in a casket? And do you know that our lives and our deaths, our deaths preach a sermon? Uh, we walk by a casket and that, our lives and our deaths preach a sermon. On a very uh, not so serious note, I heard this story. I thought you might like it. There was this very wealthy man. <clears throat> he had a brother. His brother was a scoundrel. I mean, a low-down, good-for-nothing, dirty, rotten dog. Scoundrel. And so the very wealthy man comes to the preacher right after his brother had passed away, and he said, Preacher, i tell you what. Here's a check for $100,000. If you will agree to say at my brother's funeral that he was a saint. The preacher thought about it for a minute, and he said, All right. Hand me the check. Well, he gets up at the funeral, and the preacher just goes at it. I mean, he is telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I mean, he's talking about how bad this guy is, how terrible he was. He was a scoundrel, and he just went on and on and on. The whole time, the crowd's going, what in the world? And the brother's getting angrier and angrier because he's already written the, wrote the preacher a check for $100,000. And about the time the preacher finishes his funeral message, he says, as bad as this guy is, I'll let you know something. Compared to his brother, he's a saint. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> our lives and our deaths preach a sermon. And our lives represent opportunity. Opportunity to make the right decision. Or opportunity to do the right thing. Opportunity to honor the Lord. And influence the people that we care about the most. 
And our deaths represent the end of that opportunity. And death can be a sweet thing. If the life is lived righteously and pure for the Lord, and death can be a bitter thing. And the death of Elimelech is a very bitter thing. And Elimelech was a backslider. Tonight's message is simply titled, Elimelech the Backslider. And we'll read the first five v- verses of the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Kilion died also both of them and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband Elimelech the backslider Elimelech the backslider let's begin first of all with his name Elimelech do you know what his name means his name literally means my God is king it's exciting to look through the Bible and see the names that God has named people and the stories behind their names but Elimelech, the name means, my God is king. Uh, Elimelech was growing up in the nation of Israel in a time when the nation of Israel was being ruled by judges. We've just crossed out of the book of Judges into the book of Ruth. And in those seasons where the judges reigned and ruled, that there was peace in Israel. So we understand from this passage of Scripture that, that Elimelech was living in Israel, not in a perfect time, because there is no perfect time when you have a bunch of people. But in a time when there was rest and peace and God's people were not in, in bondage to their enemies. But there comes a famine and Elimelech, his daddy, named him Elimelech, my God is king. Uh, that gives us token and evidence that Elimelech was a young man that had the opportunity to hear about God, had the opportunity to trust in the Lord. He was a, he was a young man that was, had the opportunity to be committed to God. Elimelech, my God is king. Where did he live? Bethlehem, Judah. You know what Bethlehem, Judah means? The house of bread and praise. And so we have Elimelech, a man that had his foot in the faith and his family in the land of promise, but his life ends so tragically in a coffin in a foreign pagan land. How's it happen? Elimelech was a backslider. Elimelech was a backslider. Let's just begin here tonight like this. Number one, it's beginning. Where does backsliding begin? It's beginning. Look what the scripture says in verse number one. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Where did it begin? A famine in the land. How many of you are uh, saved and you know? Would you raise your hand? Isn't it wonderful to be saved? Have the promise of everlasting life. How many of you saved people have ever had trouble? Would you raise your hand? And you still trust God? Really? Wow. I thought that when you got saved, everything was perfect from that point forward. No. We live in a sin-cursed world. We are sinful people with a sin nature. And we make messes for ourselves. How many of you ever made a mess for yourself? Aren't you glad God forgives you? It's wonderful. Now, Elimelech did something that a lot of people do. And a lot of people who have their foot in the faith and they have a beginning and they're probably even saved. Elimelech's probably a born-again man uh, by the Old Testament standard. He was probably a born-again man. He was probably a guy that faithfully attended church. He was probably a guy that did the right thing. He had a family that was rooted in in the faith. And, And Elimelech did something That caused him to backslide and get way out of God's will. What was it? Famine came. And when the trouble came, Elimelech, instead of looking to God, looking inward to God for strength, he looked outward to the world for relief. Folks, I want you to know something. 
If you are suffering and you have a famine, you have trouble, you have issues, you have burdens that you bear, and you look outside of God's holy realm for your relief, you are going to make a terrible mistake. How foolish we are in times of trouble, yearning for relief, we do something that is wicked and wrong and sinful to fulfill the lust of our flesh, to fulfill the lust of our eyes, to fulfill the pride of our lives. But I want you to know something. Children do it in the nursery, and seniors do it in the nursing home. We get in a season or a moment of famine, and instead of waiting on the blessing and promise of God, we allow our burden and our trouble to influence our decision, and we end up, because of the trouble, doing something very, very foolish. I've watched people make terrible financial decisions because they were in a famine. I watched people make terrible family decisions because they were in a famine. Here's one. I've had so many people say to me, talk to them about their marriages and husbands and wives having trouble. And Do you want to know something? I don't know any husband or wife that hasn't had some trouble along the way. You're not alone. Get help. Talk to somebody. Talk to me. But I've heard this. It's so silly. Husbands and wives think, say, you know what? We're, we're having a little trouble at home. and So what we've decided to do is we're just going to take a break from each other for a little while. That is wrong. Here's another one that's dead wrong. We're having trouble at home. And so what we've decided to do is we're just decided we're going to back out of church for a little while. My head explodes. We're having trouble with a commitment that two of us made to God. And so what we've decided the best thing to do is let's just leave God out for a while. That's wrong. It's wrong. People want relationships and they get it the wrong way. People want satisfaction and they go after it the wrong way. You get this yearning for something that you do not have and in a time of famine you go after it headlong and you go after it the wrong way. Every time it leads to backsliding and it will hurt you and it will hurt the people around you. Ask Elimelech. Where did his backsliding begin? I'll show you where it began. It began with a famine. Do you think that God would allow the people who lived in Bethlehem, the house of bread, to starve to death? No. The Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. Do you think God is going to do something that's going to ruin the future of a family? No. God has a plan. Our sin causes great trouble and grief, but God has a plan. And when you come to this moment, and some of us find ourselves there regularly, you may be there right now, when you come to this moment and this season in your life where you are anxious and you're yearning and you have a desire and a need that needs to be fulfilled, do not, do not, do not fulfill it in an unrighteous fashion because when you, in the pressure of famine, make a decision that is against God, you're making a decision that is going to both hurt you and hurt your posterity. It's going to hurt everything that matters. You're going to lose ground. It's going to be awful. So I beg of you this week, as you face famine situations where you have a yearning and a need, perceived need, and God hasn't met it yet. Do not, under any circumstance, move to Moab. Do not, in any circumstance, choose to do what is wrong in order to get what you want. If you'll wait on the Lord, He'll renew your strength. If you'll wait on the Lord, He'll meet your needs. He'll give you the desires of your heart. If you'll wait on the Lord, you will have what you need, you'll have what you want, and you'll have no regrets. You see, Elimelech made a terrible mistake. Elimelech said, hmm, cupboards are looking kind of bare. The checking account's looking a little low. I've kind of been looking down over there in Moab. It looks like they've been getting good rains, and I, I hear there's good work down there in Moab. He should have never looked to the world to meet the needs that God's promised to meet. 
You should always look to God. As soon as you turn your affection away from the Lord, you've turned yourself on the path of destruction. Elimelech was a backslider. It began with the famine. Its duration. How long did it last? Look what the Bible says in verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. What did he do? He went to sojourn. You see that word? I've circled it in my Bible. Sojourn is not a permanent word. Sojourn is a word that means I'm just going to pass through for a short time and then I'm just going to go right back. Is that how it worked out for Elimelech? Nope. Folks, I want you to know something. that You may say, I'm just going to do this so I can get a little bit of relief. Hey, you may end up trapped forever by your sin. Elimelech was trapped forever by his sin. One drink. One time using. One time saying, I just need a little bit of relief. And guess what happens? You could be trapped forever. And the people you know and love the most could be walking by your casket one day saying, Man, I hate Elimelech. Made this decision. But Elimelech, what was his intention? Was his intention to stay forever? No. He went to sojourn. He went to just stay for a little while. The Bible says this, and that there's an emphasis. The Bible says that he went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, if this was, if this was English class, we'd be taught to write this sentence a different way. Here's how we would write this sentence. I'm by no means correcting the Word of God. I just want to make a point. The Word of God's perfect. But here's how the Word of God says it. He and his wife and his two sons. Now, how would you write, how would you and I write this if we were making a proper sentence in a, on a research paper? We'd say, he, comma, his wife, comma, and his two sons. That's how we would write that. Now, the Bible, over and over again in the Scriptures, you'll see this pattern. And God emphasizes something here. And God wants us to see something about uh, this sin of Elimelech. His sin didn't only affect he... It was and his wife. And that's not it. And his two sons. There's an emphasis here. And his wife. And his two sons. And his wife. And his two sons. Some people have this idea that somehow they're on an island. And what they do is their business. Baloney. It's not true. Your actions affect the people around you. Your actions affect people, affect people that you don't even know yet. My actions affect children that haven't been born yet. You see, it affected his wife and his sons. He went to sojourn, but what happens? The Bible says in verse 2, And the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, the name of his two sons Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and, you see that word? What is it? Continued there. I've circled in my Bible the word continued. What did Elimelech say? We're just going to sojourn. What did God say? He continued. He continued. Folks, you've heard the saying. It may sound trite, but it's also true. Sin keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay and costs you more than you ever want to pay. And Elimelech testifies to that fact. He says, let's just sojourn. But the Bible says he continued there, and it doesn't stop there. Verse 3, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. The first few verses represent the life and the opportunity for influence that Elimelech had. But Elimelech got a little uncomfortable impatient on the provision of God, acted in sin, and the result is very tragic. How long did it, was it that Elimelech was stuck in Moab the rest of his life? The rest of his life. How many of you would like to throw away the rest of your life? Not me. 
But I want you to know something. There is a way to throw away the rest of your life. And you may not believe that you're throwing it away, but I'll just have you know, if you sin against God and you allow discomfort and you allow fleshly desires to overrule the principles of God's Word, then you will learn the same lesson that Elimelech learned. And it's possible that you will waste the rest of your life. I beg of you, don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Elimelech died. Well, I'm not planning on dying. Elimelech didn't plan on dying either. Elimelech said, let's just sojourn in Moab for a little bit. But he ended up continuing there and he ended up dying there. He lost his opportunity. Elimelech was a backslider. Elimelech's duration was the rest of of his life. It's awful. Isn't it sad? Thirdly, it's cost. The cost of backsliding. The cost of backsliding. Look what the Bible says in verse number three. Elimelech, Naomi's husband. There's an emphasis over and over again in this passage of scripture on Naomi and, and on Elimelech and his connection. Uh, look at it with me. Verse number one. The Bible says, he and his wife and his two sons. The Bible says in verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. There's an emphasis here. There's Naomi. We want you to see it. And the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion. Again in verse 3, Elimelech, Naomi's husband. We could have just said Elimelech died, right? We know. He just said it was Naomi. But God wants us to be reminded that Elimelech was a man with responsibility. Elimelech was a man with opportunity to influence. Elimelech was a family man. Elimelech was somebody that should have been doing what's right as opposed to looking for relief in a sinful way. Over and over the Bible reminds us that he is a white husband and a father. This is a husband. Hey, did I mention to you, we're talking about a husband and a father. Did I tell you what Elimelech was? Elimelech was a husband and a father. He was a husband and a father. You know what he did? He backslid on God. You know what it cost? The Bible says in verse number 3b, the end of the verse number 3, she, Naomi, was left and her two sons. It's awful, isn't it? We're not talking about coming to a funeral where there was a church family. They they'd departed from the, from the care of the flock and the fold. Their own people, they, they'd forsaken them. There's nobody to help. At this, if there was a funeral, there's a few pagan people walked by and offered whatever kind of hope they may have had to offer, which was no hope at all. And the Bible says that Elimelech left her and her two sons and his two sons. It's awful. What did it cost? It cost everything. His foolishness, his sinfulness affected his family in such a way. It's awful. Look what happens, verse number 4. This is very sad. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Now, I want you to know something. It was completely against God and God's will for these two boys to marry these two girls. It was completely against God's will. They were, if there was ever an unequal yoke, here it is. I'm sure that before Elimelech died that he would have been opposed to his boys marrying Moabitess women. He's probably preaching his message, you know. Here's my message. Don't you be marrying those Moabite girls. Don't you be marrying those Moabite girls. But you know what happened? Malon and Kilion let his words go in one ear and right out of the other. Why? Because the principle was already forsaken. Hey, he was already forsaken the principles. May, uh, Elimelech, what did he do? He said, it's okay to move and disobey God when it comes to money. But it's not okay to move and disobey, uh, disobey God when it comes to marriage. His boys didn't care about what he'd said about marriage because he didn't care what God said about other principles and other things. 
his inconsistency rolled into his children. And I want you to know something. Those of us here on a Sunday night that know and believe the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior, and we have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, if we are not sincere about our relationship to God and upholding graciously in the Spirit of Christ the principles of God's Word, then the people who follow us, they will gladly disregard them too. But you've drawn little lines in your own sand. He says, you know, I'll cross this one, but not that one. I'll cross this one, but not that one. And you have, you know, I may do this, but I'll tell you what, I do. You fill in the blank. I may do this, but I come to church on Sunday morning. I may do that, but I read my Bible every day. I may do this, but I pass out gospel. I may do this, but you fill in your blank. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill it in. If you're inconsistent as a child of God, do you know where you'll see it show up? You'll see it show up in your children and your grandchildren. But I want you to know something. If you sow to the wind, you reap a whirlwind. And the principle of sowing and reaping is so true. You reap what you sow and you reap more than you sow. And we should just take very seriously this situation with Elimelech. Elimelech said, you know what? We're just going to go down to Moab for a little while, get us a pocket full of money, and then we'll come back to where we're supposed to be. How's that sound? Sounds awful. What did it produce? It produced two boys that died pagan in a pagan land with no respect or reverence for their father's God. It's expensive. It cost so much to backslide. She was left and her sons. They took them wives of Moab. And look what the Bible says as we conclude. Verse number 5. And Malon and Kilion died also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Isn't this awful? It's awful. I'm thankful that the Bible gives us the ugly pictures as well as the beautiful pictures. It testifies to its righteousness and its truth. Because I want you to know something. Sin is ugly. Righteousness is beautiful. And the ugliness of this story is something that should testify to us the urgency and the need that we have to live a life in submission and humble obedience to our great God. What happened? What did it cost? What did Elimelech's decision to say, you know, just for a short time we'll move away from the Lord? What did it cost him? Everything. Everything. What? Everything. Folks, the stakes are high. The risk is high to backslide on God. Oh, it's so high. And we all bear a certain responsibility. If Elimelech was saved, the judgment he'll face was awful. It's sad. Elimelech backslid, Elimelech backslid on God. And it cost him everything. I know a family... I don't give personal stories very much. None of you know them, I wouldn't imagine. But I know a family, and their testimony, it's one that's quite sad. As a young married couple, they were committed to the Lord. I mean, faithful. They had children, and they were faithful to church, faithful to the Lord. They did things right. They were determined to please the Lord, but they had a season of difficulty. They let a couple people in the church hurt their feelings. They let something that the preacher said bother them. I don't know all the details of what set them off, but they got in their minds that I'm tired of this whole 
church thing. I'm tired of this whole rule thing. I'm tired of this whole honor the Lord and be faithful. I'm tired of it. I don't want to do that anymore. And I, I'm just, I'm tired of it. And as a husband and wife, they together agreed that they would no longer attend church. They would not, not, no longer enforce rules and of standards of righteousness in their home. I'm not talking about being a rigid military-like existence, but hey, look, you've got to tell children no. You got, there's, certain, there's things you've got to tell children no. You've got to protect them from things that the devil wants to use to destroy them. But this family said, you know what, we're not doing that anymore. Forget it. Forget it. This was 45 years ago that they stepped away from the Lord. Four or five years they stepped away from God, realized the error of their way. I'm talking four or five years. They realized the error of their way. And husband and wife rededicated their lives to the Lord Jesus. And God's been good to them. But I want you to know something. More than once they've testified to me of their deep regret because their children and their grandchildren and now their great-grandchildren have suffered the most from their stepping away from God for just a season. The product of their disobedience has cost them, some of their family, everything. Why? Did it have to? No. But like Elimelech, you know what they did? They said, man, it's a little tough. It's uncomfortable. Let's go to Moab. And right when their children needed it the most, Elimelech and Naomi went to, went to Moab. Right when this family needed God the most, they went to the world. What it cost? Years and years of great burden and problem. And discord in their family. What did it cost Elimelech? Everything. Folks, I want you to know something. Elimelech backslid. Elimelech backslid. And it was awful. Who could do it around here? All of us. Who needs to be warned by the life of Elimelech? All of us. May God help us. When things begin to get uncomfortable, let's just not let it start. Let's keep our eyes fixed on God, resting in the promises of the Lord, knowing that he'll meet our every need. And doing what's right and pleasing the Lord is always what's right. May God help us to learn from the backsliding of Elimelech. May it never even start as we keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's pray.